If you remember, we were going through five reasons to never give up in prayer. Jesus said this in the beginning of a parable, Luke chapter 18, verse 1. He told them a parable to the effect, and this is the effect that this parable is to have on you and me, that we ought always to pray and not lose heart. And I think we've all known the discouragement of praying and it doesn't seem like the answer is coming or it's taking a long time to come. And he said, in those type of situations, continue to pray. Don't give up. Don't lose heart. Don't become discouraged. Don't grow weary. Don't throw in the towel. Continue to seek your heavenly Father. And Hebrews chapter 10, verse 35, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. For you have need of endurance. And if you will endure, if you will continue to steadfastly, patiently pray, when you've done the will of God, you will receive what is promised. So don't give up. Be encouraged. Draw on the strength from your heavenly Father. Know that He loves you. He knows exactly what you're going through. And He is there to meet the need. And until the prayer is answered, and the manifestation comes, He will give you the grace and the strength to go through and endure whatever is necessary. For yet a little while, and the coming one will come and will not delay. But my righteous one shall live by faith. We're not dictated to by our senses. The closer you draw to God, the less you will rely on your physical senses in this life. And the more you will rely on the power of faith, the eye of faith, seeing the unseen. He says, my righteous one shall live by faith. We don't live by sight. Circumstances do not dictate how we react or what we do. He says, but if we shrink back, God's soul will have no pleasure in us. Remember, in Hebrews, it says that only by faith can we please God. And so if we shrink back from that faith, God has no pleasure in that. He loves to have your heart. He loves to have your trust. He loves to have your enduring patience, knowing that He does all things right. But he says, we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed. That's the price we pay if we give up and lose our faith. We will be destroyed. But we are of those who have faith and preserve their souls. And so I'm going to do this real quick. It's going to be so lightning fast, you will be amazed. We're going to go review those five (laughs) reasons that we went through why we never give up in prayer. Number one. God is working even when we don't see any natural indications. And remember the story, that great story of the prophet Elisha with his servant. And they were surrounded by the enemy. And the servant thought doomsday had arrived and he was breathing his last breath. And he said, Master, what what do we do? And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, please open his eyes that he may see. So the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire, God's angels all around Elisha. And so when you pray, just remember, God is at work. God is moving. And though everything in the natural may be contrary, God is at work. He always is. We just can't see it. So that's why we live by faith. Number two, remember this. We never give up in prayer because there's nothing impossible with God. Sometimes circumstances progress, or maybe I should say digress, and we think, oh, what's the point now? It's too late now. We'll never change or turn this thing around. Have you ever felt like that? He says in Jeremiah 32, verse 17, Ah, Lord God, it is you who have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and by your outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. If he spun all of these planets into orbit and created the universe, and 
He fills not only the heavens, but the heaven of heavens, the Bible says. Nothing's too hard for him. He can reverse anything that needs to be reversed, even in the situation with Lazarus. He brought Lazarus back from the dead. Number three, God does not work according to our expectations or plans. And there's this one sentence that I just want to read again because I think we really need to take note of it and remind ourselves of this constantly. His ways and methods are incomprehensible. He's he's going to come up with a way to answer your prayer that you never thought or imagined could be. That's how great he is. His ways and methods are incomprehensible. They're never predictable. And when I say that, remember, God is always faithful to his word. He never operates outside of the boundaries of his word. But yet, within the boundaries of his word, he says, don't remember the things of the past because I'm going to do a new thing. And so don't assume, oh, I know how God will do this. He'll do it like he did before. Not necessarily. And then thirdly, many times his ways seem contradictory. You know, I think, when was that? I think last Sunday maybe we were talking out of John chapter 6. Oh yeah, for communion. Remember we read that short passage where he starts to tell the the Jews, the people who had come gathered around, that um, he was the bread of life. And they said, how can you give us your flesh to eat? And, you know, Rick pointed out, I think at the end, that that got Jesus into a lot of hot water. That got the Christians into a lot, hot of, a lot of hot water. And they were actually accused of cannibalism because they're eating the flesh of people. Well, that's not really what Jesus meant. And so then, you know, there, there was uh, a lot of confusion and kind of strife among the crowd. And so Jesus just pours it on some more. And he says, well, not only is my flesh bread for you to eat, but you must drink my blood. And now people are going berserk, right? And it says that all of the disciples except the 12 original left him. So if they were all present, which they probably were, that's 70 to 72 other disciples, uh, kind of the second tier of disciples, they walked out on him. And you think, Jesus, this is no way to win friends and influence people. Your attendance is going the wrong direction, Jesus. You just lost about 70-some people. Why would you do that? And then, you know, again, we, we talked about people like Joseph, how God raised him up to be second in command of the greatest nation on earth by starting him out as a slave and a criminal in jail, an accused criminal. And then Jesus is going to usher in the kingdom of heaven, and how does, how does he do it? He dies on a cross. If you're going to start a kingdom, the king probably shouldn't die. That's not a really good game plan. And so lots of times God does things in strange ways that seem somewhat contradictory to the human mind, and we really can't comprehend how it is but the wisdom of God all along. Number four, God gives the grace. He gives the strength. He gives the patience and the contentment for us to wait for our prayers to be answered every time without fail. For For they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. If you're thinking like a human being tonight, you're thinking, well, the longer I wait, the weaker I'm getting. And with the Lord, it's just the opposite. Look, remember this in Romans chapter 4 about Abraham? It says here, Abraham did not weaken in faith. So see, when you're standing in faith and trusting the Lord and waiting upon the Lord to move, your faith does not weaken. Your faith gets stronger because you're now operating in the supernatural. Remember verse 20, no unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. It's, and you've probably experienced this in your life. It's almost as if the more impossible the situation becomes, the stronger the faith rises up in your heart. Have you ever noticed that? 
So that's why we never give up. We talked uh, two weeks ago, since we canceled last Thursday night, we talked about the fact that God's timing is perfect. And God's timing is so important in prayer, and we don't understand God's timing. But just really quick through four or five verses here, Genesis 18, 14, God spoke to Abraham and he said, at the appointed time, I, the Lord, will return and Sarah shall have a son. At the appointed time. Psalm 75, verse 2, at the set time that I appoint, I will judge with equity. Galatians chapter 4, verse 4, and when the fullness of time had come, do you see the pattern here? There is a time for God to do what he does in our lives. Galatians chapter 6, verse 9, let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap. God's the one that sets that due season. Romans chapter 5, verse 6, for while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. So if you've been praying for something and you don't see the answer, just wait for it. Remember Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 3, for still the vision awaits its what? It's appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. So just keep that promise in your heart. Let it refresh your spirit. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, we know that very well. For everything there is a season, a time for every matter under heaven. Verse 11, he's made everything beautiful in its time. And then remember the story of Joseph, how he uh, tells the, the butler and the baker the interpretation for uh, their dreams while they were in jail. And so Joseph says to the butler, hey, can you remember me when you get in front of Pharaoh? Because, you know, it's not right that I'm here. I didn't do anything wrong to deserve this. I've done nothing that they should put me into the pit. So when you're before Pharaoh, can you just speak of me favorably to him? And look at verse 23. Yet the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph, but what? Forgot him. Do you remember? Does anybody remember how many days this was? I'm holding up my fingers. It's three. No, it was just three days from... Now, you're right. You're thinking of how long the the whole thing. But from the time he interpreted the dreams to the time the butler was standing in front of Pharaoh and he could have mentioned Joseph, it was only three days. Now, a lot of us can't remember something for one hour, so I guess three days is not all that bad. But uh, why why uh, why did the butler forget I mean, this, this is kind of like divine dementia here, right? He forgot because it wasn't time. And remember, then it was, what, two years? I think the scripture says two more years when he finally remembered. And so for whatever reason, Joseph needed to be there in the jail two more years. Now, if you're Joseph, wouldn't that frustrate you? Two more years, Lord? you know how long I've been here? That takes a lot of trust, doesn't it? To trust God for his perfect timing. I really like this passage in Acts chapter 4, verse 1. Jesus is getting ready to ascend into heaven, and his disciples ask, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And what do they say? What does Jesus say? It is not for you to know times and seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. And what he's saying to them is, if I told you, if I revealed to you some of the mysteries of God's timing, you couldn't get it. You would not understand. It's just not for you to know the times or the seasons. And so we walk by trust, don't we? Tonight, what I want to talk about, and I didn't want to make this number six, but it is a principle that I would just like to share and remind our hearts from the scriptures But prayer's ultimate purpose is a holy, surrendered communion with God. Prayer is not some magical ATM where you can go and if you push the right buttons, you get what you want or you get what you need. 
God wants you. He wants your heart. And a lot of times we think, well, why isn't the answer coming? And why do I have to go back and seek God again and again and again? And it's taking so long and I'm just constantly praying. Now listen to what you just said. I'm constantly praying. Do you think that may be part of the reason why God hasn't answered your prayer yet? Maybe he knows that if you, he gave you the answer to your prayer, you wouldn't be so diligent to keep coming back to him again and again. And so maybe he's training your heart. You know, when we have to go back to God again and again and again, it's training your heart. You know what? I haven't gotten my answer yet, but I sure have developed a wonderful relationship with my heavenly father. And if this is what it took for me to get on my knees and seek the heart of my Father, then I'm glad the answer hasn't come yet. Father is far more interested in having a relationship with you than he is in answering your prayer. And we'll see that here. John chapter 6, verse 24. So when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum, and look at the next two words, John 6, 24. Seeking who? Jesus. Well, this is a good thing, right? They're seeking Jesus. There's a lot of people out there seeking Jesus. But we'll find out in the story that motive is everything. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Now, this is important, and you've got to understand what Jesus was saying here. Because if, if you just casually look at this verse, you're going to think, well, Jesus is telling them that they're just seek, they, they, they want to see something happen. They want to see a sign. They want to see a miracle. Or they want to have their belly full. What's the difference? Sounds pretty carnal to me, either way you look at it. But that's not what he's saying. Those signs testified to who he was. Remember these verses? Uh, let me go to some of these. Acts chapter 2, verse 22. Uh, this is Peter speaking, giving that sermon, the first sermon. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst. So the signs and the wonders and the miracles were Jesus' credentials. Those signs and wonders were sealing in their minds and hearts who Jesus was. It was, it was showing them that he did come from God. He says in John chapter 5, verse 36, For the works that the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I am doing, bear witness about me that the Father has sent me. Those signs, those miracles, demonstrated who Jesus was, that he was the Son of God, that he was one with God. Remember Nicodemus in John chapter 3, verse 2? This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God. And watch what he said. For no one can do these signs that you do unless what? God is with him. So the signs and the wonders were the credentials of Jesus given by his heavenly father to show everybody, this is my son. He is one with me. Listen to him. And so when he says there in verse 26, truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs. In other words, you're not seeking me for who I am. You're seeking me for a free meal. You're not seeking me because you saw the signs that demonstrate who I am. You're seeking me for your carnal desires to be met. You're not seeking me because you want to know me and hear me and understand me. You're seeking me to get a free meal. You see it there? 
And then he goes on and he says, do not work for the food that perishes, for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. And yet they go on and they say, well, Lord, what, what must we do to do the works of God? And he says, this is the work of God that you believe in him who he has sent. And so they respond and they say, well, what sign are you going to do? What work do you perform so that we can believe in you? And then look at what they do. These guys tried to sneak in the back door. Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Hint, hint. If you miraculously produce some bread here, that would be great, Lord. I don't think you can sneak up on Jesus. And he said, truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my father. And then he says in verse 35, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. So what is he saying? Jesus is communicating to them the message, don't come to me just to get what you want. Come to me because you love me. Come to me to know who I am. Come to me because you want to be in fellowship with me. You want to have a conversation with me. You want to walk together in the garden and spend time together. That is the ultimate purpose of prayer. For you and Father to intimately talk, love each other, know each other, commune with each other. That is God's purpose for prayer. Does he answer your needs? Yes. Does he want you to come to him with your needs? Yes. But priority number one for prayer is to know God. Jesus said in John 17, this is life eternal that you might know me. And he said, you should be coming to me because you love me, because you know me. Not because there's a shopping list that you want to give me. And so when you think about that and think about your prayer life, can you just pause for a moment and think, when was the last time I spent time with my Heavenly Father and just worshipped Him for who He was without asking Him for anything? When was the last time that I came to my Heavenly Father and communed with Him because I wanted to be with Him more than to have my natural desires met? When was the last time I came to him to just honor him and listen to his voice and tell him how much I love him and I'm so thankful for all that he's done without rattling off a list of requirements? When was the last time you loved him just for him and spent time with him intimately? Now, remember John chapter 6. John chapter 6, he feeds 5,000 people. In the beginning of this same chapter, he feeds 5,000 people. And then, then they come searching for him because he leaves and travels across the sea, so they get in the boats to find him. And he says to them, why are you coming after me? You just want more bread. But you didn't get in those boats and come across the sea because you love me. You love the free food. Now think, before this, he fed 5,000. Did he feed anybody after this discussion? No. Nope. Jesus wasn't about to just give them bread on demand. And I think there's an important lesson in all of this is that when we come to Father and we want his answers, when we want our way before we want him, he's not going to answer us. And a lot of times it's a painful process, but in prayer, when we're not getting the answers to the prayers that we pray, we need to stop and ask, do I want this answer more than I want God? Am I praying just to use God as some divine ATM machine? And if I punch the right buttons, then I'll, I'll get my way? Or am I here to fellowship with the Heavenly Father that I love, the Heavenly Father that I desire? 
the heavenly father that I pant after? Am I praying because I love him so much? Or am I praying just trying to manipulate the circumstances? The ultimate purpose of prayer is not for you to get your needs met. The ultimate purpose of prayer is for you to commune with your heavenly father, period. Remember Luke chapter 10, verse 38? As they went on their way, Jesus entered a village and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she says, Lord, do you not care? The disciples tried that one time too, if you remember. They're out at sea. And the wind and the wave was tossing the boat around. That's probably not the best time to ask, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. And what did Jesus say? Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but only what? One thing is necessary. All of this stuff that you think is so important, Martha, listen, only one thing is necessary to sit at the feet of Jesus. And you know the story, Jesus never instructed Mary to get up and help her sister, did he? Martha's prayer was not answered. Why? Because Martha thought getting help to get all this stuff done was more important than sitting at Jesus' feet. And when you think that Getting all of those things done that you want the Lord to do for you is more important than sitting at his feet. More than likely, your prayers are not going to be answered. Because you're seeking him just like the crowds wanted another free meal. One thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion which will not be taken away from her. No, Martha, I'm not going to answer your prayer. I'm not, I'm not going to do what you just asked me to do. Because what Mary has chosen is the best. There was, there's only one thing necessary. We get so stressed out with deadlines and things we've got to get accomplished. And, and yes, there are deadlines in life. I'm not trying to minimize that. But in the midst of it all, we've got to have the heart that recognizes only one thing is really necessary. And that's for me to sit at Jesus' feet. Let's end there. I can't end there. Psalms 27, verse 2. When evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh, my adversaries and foes, it is they who stumble and fall, not me. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war arise against me, yet will I be confident. And then verse 4 seems like he just slams on the brakes, does a U-turn or something. But you wonder, how does this flow in context? One thing have I asked of the Lord, and that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. So in the midst of life happening, and his enemies are surrounding him, and armies are encamping against him, And God's doing wonderful things to deliver and save him. In the midst of all of that excitement and activity, David says what? There's really only one thing that matters. To dwell in the house of the Lord, to gaze upon his beauty, and to inquire in his temple. That's the ultimate purpose of prayer. And that one thing is something that we've got to really keep in our hearts because a lot of times our prayers are not getting answered because we have the wrong motive. We want the answer more than we want God. Father, we thank you for how your word teaches and instructs us. And Lord, we we thank you for the, the exercise of prayer. It stretches our faith. It causes us to die to ourself. Prayer causes us to surrender and depend upon you instead of depending upon ourselves. And Father, the more we wrestle in prayer, the more our motives are exposed. And sometimes we realize, I've been praying. 
I've been praying the right thing for the wrong reason. And I've been loving the answer to prayer more than I love the one I'm praying to. I've got this thing backwards. And I need to remember that prayer is all about communion with a holy God. Father, thank you for your instruction to us. And as we go, we pray that you would keep us safe. Surround us with your angels. Father, let there be a holy fire burning in our heart that drives us to our knees to seek you. And we thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.